Welcome to Crossroad Connection. We're speaking out for those left unheard. My name is David Schuringa. I'm the host of your program, and I'm the president of Crossroad Bible Institute. Now, as you know, Crossroad Bible Institute has been uh, an advocate for people in prison around the world for many, many years, 30 years, in fact. Uh, but, you know, there's more than one way to confine people. And today we have uh, in the studio with me today um, a good friend, Sid Jansma, who is um, a, a, a businessman located here in Grand Rapids, Michigan, a philanthropist, and uh, like I said, a good friend. And he recently, with his son Jonathan, first of all, welcome, Sid. I thank you, Dave. Yeah, just delighted to have you on the program. Um, you just came back from um, Burma or Myanmar. My, I can never say that. Myanmar. Myanmar. Um, uh, otherwise known as Burma. And you were out there with your 14-year-old son. And as I was saying uh, to the folks, uh, you know, we, we seek to uh, help people that are incarcerated. But you came across a situation there where there was really an entire population of people that were uh, limited in their movement and not in a prison with bars, but another type of prison. But let's uh, let's back up a minute. How did you get interested in that country and end up going there? This is this is like between India, China, it's, Bangladesh, right? That that is correct. It is in Southeast Asia, located between India and Thailand, and just south of China. And uh, my wife and I have been uh, interested in this country for a number of years. Really? And have been supporting some mission groups that have been over there. Um, but it's the last couple of years that we've become interested in a particular people group uh, known as the Rohingya. Mm -hmm. And they are a group that is uh, located throughout the country. Um, I understand there is about 1.3 million of them in the country. Um, but a number of them live on the west side of the country, just south of Bangladesh. And... They have had a number of conflicts with their, the local people over the past several years that escalated and they, as they escalated. And I think both sides, um, both the Rohingya and the Rakhine people who are mixed with each other, you know, were probably uh, culpable in uh, various instances. But as it escalated two years ago, um, it got to the point where this particular people group of the Rohingya was you know, forced out of their homes, forced out of their jobs, and put into camps outside um, one of the major cities called Sitway. Camps? You know, camps. Yeah. Uh, like with tents and shacks and, and just, but, but, I think kick, but kicked out of their homes. Kicked out of their homes. Now, yeah. the, the Many of their homes then were in turn burned down. Um, I, Jonathan and I witnessed neighborhoods that had been burned down and that had been leveled with bulldozers. Um, where there were thousands of people that were displaced. Now, the dominant uh, people group there are Buddhists, correct? Th that is correct. And the Rohingyas are Muslims. Are Muslims. So if the country is 95% Buddhist, there might be a few percent Muslims. And mm -hmm. is this the, um, I think I read somewhere that this has the, like the longest civil war in history? Well, the, now you're going back to some of the history of Myanmar. And I mean, th that's still going on. Kind th of, there right? actually I mean, is still tension. there is still fighting in Myanmar to this day. Yeah. And the fighting is between other ethnic groups and the national government. And there has not been necessarily fighting be between the Rohingya and the government. They have been just isolated and picked out and then put into these camps, um, I think, primarily because of their Muslim religion. Now, um, I understand they are Sunni Muslims. So is that right? I would not be able to tell you if they're Sunni well, or Shia. My research says Sunni, so um, are, 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 is the Buddhist government afraid that they're going to be terrorists or something like that, or what's, what's going on? I think they do mention that, uh -huh. but I don't know if that is truly the uh, root behind it right, or not, Dave. Right, right, right. Yeah. It could be an excuse to keep uh, people sub subjected, right? What, what we witnessed and, and what made us interested in this was that these are poor people, who have been forsaken. Mm -hmm. And as a Christian, we felt that uh, someone needs to be understanding their plight and raise the awareness of them. And so Jonathan and I went, uh, we, we visited much of Myanmar, and it is a beautiful country. That's what, I, that's what I've read. They have beautiful, beautiful um, Buddhist temples. 
uh, rich, I mean, rich in um, rich in culture and history and the people. There are many people groups within Myanmar. I mean, so it is not just Burmans, but uh, Shan and Karens, Kareni, Chin. I mean, the Rohingya, they, and in general, they are wonderful people. But so their their economy and their and their society is quite backwards, correct? In ter in terms in terms of um, they are still a developing country. Yeah, they are still a developing country, but. They, I, I believe you know things will be changing there over the years. Um, they have had a military dictatorship mm. since 1961, which has um, kept a lid on much of the economy, um, but that has been changing as well. Um, so there are some positive changes happening in Myanmar, and, and for that we can be thankful. Yeah, you bet, and I, I want to get beyond this economy stuff, but I understand there's also rich oil and gas deposits off of there thing are, are there for, are there foreign investors and stuff doing that is that government controlled or how, how, how are those resources managed in our country well i think the government controls all their resources yeah um but then they are letting in foreign um, international companies to come in and start to develop stuff for them and you have a lot of the chinese and the indian governments who yeah, are they're pretty close very to China, aren't very they? interested in um, helping them do that okay now let's talk about this uh the, the these um rohingyas um, are, are these people that have just newly arrived in this country and that's why they're just not trusted? In, in many cases, they've been there for generations. Mm. And so that's, I mean, they've been there for generations. They have lived in these, um, you know, their cities and villages for generations. Um, so this is not something that has just um, newly happened. These aren't like illegal immigrants or something like that? No, it is, that is the case. Yeah. Um, and so tell us a little bit what their life is like. They... Uh, are not allowed to live in regular neighborhoods. They're, are they confined in, in those camps, or can they, are they free to come and go? Do they have jobs? Do they vote? I mean, what's, what's their life like? Well, I can tell you what Jonathan and I experienced right. as we went and witnessed it. Yeah. Um, so we, as we flew into a city, I mean, I, sometimes I think people don't realize there are working airlines, very nice airlines there. Hmm. We flew into the city of Sitwe, um, and we stayed there. And around the city and around the state, uh, the Rakhine State, um, of which Sitwe is the capital, there are around 80 different camps. 80 different 80 camps, camps housing um, 140,000 Rohingya people. So that's the magnitude that we're talking about here, 140,000 people. These, these camps, I guess I use camps, there's not tents, um, but what they are is um, makeshift shelters made out of bamboo poles, you know, temporary bamboo poles. Um, a lot of them have just plastic tarps as roofs for their, uh, you know, for their little one-room shelters. Mm -hmm. um, they're very small. You know, a family lives in a very small, confined space. Um, thousands of people are put together and then in a very small area. You know, it's built in uh, kind of, you know, uh, dirt plains. You know, I mean, you're out in a field here. Um, next, to, primarily in this case, you're next to um, the ocean, the, the Indian Ocean. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of confines them on one side. And where we visited, I mean, there's a couple roads that go into it, and these roads then have police checkpoints and barbed wire um, separating those who can go in and those who can go out. So the camps so, do have barbed wire around them? The area has barbed wire keeping people in. The camps themselves don't. So if you could picture in, and I, uh, it's hard for me to say if it's a you know, 10 square mile area, 20 square mile area, mm -hmm. but you've got an, a larger area that um, is kind of like a peninsula. And to go in and out, you have to go through police checkpoints. And so the Rohingya are not allowed out. After the break, I'd like you to give us a taste, an idea of what life is like for the Rohingyas there in that particular camp, okay? I would be happy to. We'll be right back after this. Stay connected to what's happening at Crossroad Bible Institute with Crossroad Network News. This free magazine is designed to keep you informed and inspired about what Christ Church is doing in prisons and jails. If you'd like a free subscription to Crossroad Network News, fill out the form online by visiting us at cbi.fm. Welcome back to Crossroad Connection. My name is David Scheringa, speaking with Sid Jansma here today. Sid, it's just uh, so good to have you here, and you've just been on a very um, interesting journey uh, and telling us all about, the, uh, and especially, you know, there in Burma, we're talking about this whole group of people, the Rohingyas, who are in camps and not allowed to get out, 
and we kind of explained and talked about the background of that. These are Muslims. The dominant people group are Buddhists, and they're really keeping this group under control. What is life like? You and Jonathan were actually in these camps. We're, we're allowed to visit those camps, correct? That is correct. Your 14-year-old yep. son. It must yep. have made quite an impact on him. Explain for our viewers what life is like for a ring and that um, in in the in that camp. What you know? What what's what what was your feel for what daily life was like? Many things come through my mind here, hmm. and I mean the first thing you notice is just. Uh, the various colored tarps that act as the roofs for a lot of the shelters there. I mean, it's it's a you know small congested area, you know, built and kind of these old uh, you know um, you know tidal plains. I mean, just off the ocean, you know, so they are at risk for typhoons and flooding. Um, you know, there's not uh, there's no paved roads here. You know, and over the last two years that the people have been in these camps, different aid groups have come in and helped build some. You know, fresh water pumps and put in some latrines. So that's at least help give them some sanitary sewer system. Right. right. But in general, life for them is, um, you know, one without hope. You know, they, they have been moved, forcibly moved from their homes um, in their villages or in the city and put into these camps and they're not allowed to leave. So there's little food. I mean, some of the people are registered. Um, with the government and they are entitled to some rice. Um, other people are not. I could not find any rhyme or reason why some were registered and some were not. And I think in general it goes back to the government is making it very hard for the Rohingya people to have citizenship mm -hmm. in their country. They don't recognize them as citizens. They, they, they do not recognize them as citizens. I think I read, that, so, that I read is somewhere one of the problems. that I think I read somewhere that a few of them do have those the, the cards because at one time uh, there was a group after them for for voting. Yeah. In a, in a, in so, and so they used them for that, but then the well, most I met, I met people whose parents were citizens, but then who all of the kids were not citizens. Huh. And there was no rhyme or reason that I could discern. And isn't there a problem if um, maybe a Buddhist person would marry somebody, a Rohingya, and they kind of forfeit their rights too then? I, I can't speak to that. Yeah. yeah. Um, what, what, do you, what, what do you sense is the purpose of the government for confining them rather than allowing them to be in the population. Why is, what's it going is, on? It is hard for me to tell because what, what we have learned, I mean, and what I have learned over the past uh, you know, several months, um, there has been a human rights group um, called Fortify Rights that has released a report specifically on the Rohingya um, a few months ago. And what they're saying in this report is that there are actually state um, policies and laws that have been in place to discriminate against them for such things as um, freedom of movement around the state, um, such things as um, needing special permits to marry. And these are special laws specifically pertaining to the Rohingya and sounds not like, pertaining like to the majority version, group. Their version of the Jim Crow laws or something, Th right? That's correct. Yeah. And if you think about it, when you have some of these restrictions, uh, restrictions on movement, um, you're suddenly limited to what kind of jobs you can get. Mm. You're limited to what kind of health care is available to you. And when the health care is very limited as it is, um, restrictions on movement virtually eliminate that. Now you put into the fact that uh, over the last two years, they've been put into specific areas of these camps. Um, you know, you asked me what it was like. Well, you know, there is no health care available. Now, the government will say to you that they have built clinics, and I was actually able to witness clinics there that had been built um, but not staffed. So yeah. the government is actually, all, the other thing they are doing is keeping, uh, not allowing unfettered aid to reach these people. So there are a number of groups that would like to be involved in providing food, um, medicine, you know, other daily needs, and the government is not allowing unfettered access. And so again, you know, Jonathan and I witnessed, um, you know, young children, you know, who were sick and not able to get the help they needed. Um, another young boy whose leg had been broken in the riots that had put them in these camps in the first place, who his leg has still not healed and he is not able to get the medical attention he needs. Um, since the people are not able to leave this general area, they're not able to work. 
-hmm. So if you think about all the um, fathers and husbands out there who are now in camps and unable to work, you know, but, you know, kept confined, you know, that's, uh, that's a recipe for despair. And uh, it certainly is not, uh, you know, fair nor just. And that is one of the reasons I'd like to just highlight them today. Is right. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's why I wanted to have you on the, on the program, because uh, to have it be an eyewitness to um, what's going on there. Um, you know, most people have never heard of the Rohingyas, um, you know, let alone what's going on in a country like that. Could, could uh, I, I'm, I'm still I'm kind of still mystified in terms of why um, these are doing it. Is it just is it just purely um, racism? Um, you know, uh, have the Ro Rohingyas been um, rebels and uh, you know a threat to the peace of the country? You 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 are asking a good question, and I asked that several times. Yeah, how does this happen? Right, and why is it happening? Right, and I was not able to get a satisfactory answer. And I believe, some I mean something so unjust as this, I I don't think there is a rational answer, mm. other than what I'm witnessing is the government's policies, and they might be, um, you know, for what they're leaving undone as much as for what they're doing, they are making life very tough for this people so that the, the net result of it is they want to leave. And I think that is the government's end goal, is to have these people leave okay. their country. Get, get it in a boat and find your way over to the next country. So they want to make life very difficult. Very difficult, so they'll try to get out of there. Yeah. Okay. Last year, um, during the, the, the non-rainy season, non-typhoon time, 50,000 people, you know, these Rohingya, got on boats and left the country. And mm. they're trying to flee to um, Malaysia or Thailand or Bangladesh. Now, not all these countries want them in at all. Sure. And so when they do this... Bangladesh, the, like they the, need more people, right? Yeah. The, when they do this, the uh, people take their life into their own hands, both mm -hmm. for um, dying at sea, mm -hmm. you know, and taking, you know, overcrowded boats. And also many of them play into the hands of uh, human traffickers who then take them on these boats and end up using oh, them sure. and just, you know, s selling them for other gain. Um, so it's, it's, it's just mind boggling, isn't it? Um, aren't they limited in terms of how many children they can have and things like that too? Policies I understand is that they are only supposed to have two children. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. um, you know what begs the question for me is, how did you get in there? It seems to me that th it seems to me that this would be a great embarrassment for the country. Um, they're trying to get more into the world trade and be recognized and get sanctions get rid of. How on the road do they let a couple of Americans go in there and get a bird's eye view and come out and tell everybody? Well, there's a good question also. <laughs> I mean, and and I can only tell you. I mean, we uh, we flew into the city of Sitway, yeah. and then we drove out to these camps, and uh, just like that, just like that. And we went through the, I mean, we were not stopped going through the checkpoints. You didn't feel threatened at all? Uh, I did not feel threatened at all. In fact, I, the um, Myanmar people, I mean, they are wonderful people. And it is a, that's part of the conundrum to me. They are, um, they are kind. You know, they are, you know, their culture, they're very friendly. Um, so I never felt threatened at all. And I am surprised that they would not see the injustice of what they are doing to people who are their friends and neighbors. But you know, I guess I guess when you think about any kinds of, of racism and in our own in our own country and stuff too, it, it ultimately it is irrational, isn't it? And I, I guess it's sin is irrational. It doesn't make sense really, does it? I think you're right. I think it, it's it's irrational and then it stems from um, you know, the differences, you know, focusing on the differences instead of the sameness. After the break, I want to ask the real tough question. These are Muslims. Why should we care? We'll be right back after this. Correcting Bible study lessons is crucial to helping inmates. To partner with CBI in this safe and secure role, please visit us at cbi.fm on the web. Welcome back to Crossroad Connection. We've been having a very enlightening conversation here with uh, my good friend, Sid Jansma, who has been to Burma, and we're talking about the Rohingya people, the Sunni Muslims that are, you know, virtually incarcerated. They're in camps there. And I think we came to the conclusion that uh, the only thing we can figure out in this irrational 
kind of setting. They just want them to go away. And uh, in the meantime, they're not getting proper care. They can't work. Food is, you know, not, not properly distributed to them. So, I mean, they're in extreme, they're in extreme poverty. Um, okay, let's, let's ask the tough question. Um, these are Muslims. And we're fighting them in the mid uh, east. Um, they're killing Christians and Jews in Iraq. Uh, so what do we, what do we, why, why should we care about these Muslims? Well, Dave, I think that's a great question. And it's something that even I, I've wrestled with and my son and I talked about when we were over there. And uh, we, we are Christians. We are uh, followers of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And as we think about how we live out our life um, as a follower of Jesus Christ, one of the things that comes to me is, you know, we are told to love our neighbor as ourself. Mm -hmm. And as we're told to love our neighbor, um, Jesus gives us the story of who is our neighbor. And the, the story he tells us is about the good Samaritan who came and took care of a man on the side of the road. And when I think about that story and realize that the Samaritan was not a Jew, he was actually despised yeah. by the Jews. And you know, yeah. you, of the, you would have been the last person you would have expected to care for the person on the side of the road. In fact, they didn't choose, they didn't even want to walk through Samaria, right? That's I mean, correct. They, they were almost That's like correct. in a camp of their own, weren't they? So I believe that, I mean, God, the Holy Spirit put that story in my mind to realize that these are our neighbors and we need to love them. And while they might, might not be followers of Jesus Christ at this time, um, through our actions and then our relationships and then our words, they might be in the future. And so that is one of the big motivating factors for me and my family in supporting the Rohingya in this situation. As a church, we, um, you know, around the world, I think, uh, we have now sort of a, a week where we talk about the persecuted church and uh, groups of Christians in many places. But we probably, would you, would you say we should be as equally concerned about persecuted Muslims? I think we should be concerned about persecuted people. Okay. And I think, you know, our, our God talks about, I mean, he's a God of the widows and the orphans. Yeah. And he's for people who are in despair and he gives hope. And so I think as Christians, with uh, we being one of the instruments of bringing, you know, the light of God into the world, we are called to bring that hope and love to um, persecuted people everywhere. Mm -hmm. So my family has been called to work with the Rohingya. Others might be called to work with, um, you know, displaced Syrians or the people in South Sudan. Yeah. Um, but there are um, no shortage of people who need our help, um, both for advoca advocacy and um, actual um, food and medicine. Well, I think that you're, you're, you're right on. Um, uh, in the Old Testament and New Testament, they talk about uh, the importance of treating alien and strangers um, as if they're the people of God uh, with the same thing. And I think that has to mean more than just, we've used those texts to talk about um, uh, undocumented immigrants that come into our country. Mm -hmm. But it strikes me that we need to see that in a broader sense. At least you're opening my eyes to see that in a broader sense. Not only are the strangers in our midst, but what about the ones who are different from us and in trouble out there because it's in our world. Can't we? Can't we? we and and it's a small world today. Yeah. And yeah. So uh, yeah, I mean, those in our world yeah. who are the strangers and, and the persecuted, we need to help. Yeah. I, I I would like to make sure I mention a couple things we can do to help. Yes, them. please do. I mean, one of them is you know we can pray, and mm -hmm. I mean I believe in the power of prayer, uh, praying for justice for the Rohingya praying that the policies of the Myanmar government will change towards them. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, I think we can make our representatives aware that we are interested in advocating for these Rohingya people. Okay. And our, our president um, will be going over to visit Myanmar um, next month again. And uh, I mean, the country is changing. And to the extent that our president knows that we care about all the people in Myanmar, he can make sure he says the right things to their government also. So prayer... Number two, make our government officials aware that we're aware. Yeah. What else? Uh, I think a third one would be there are, to help support groups that are actively involved in this country with this, um, with this issue. And two of them that come to mind are um, Partners Relief and Development. 
Partner, say it again. Partners Relief and Development. Okay. They're an organization that brings in um, food, medicine, and the gospel to the people of Myanmar. And they've been doing it under very difficult um, situations, but doing a great job of it for um, a number of years now. Who else is busy there? uh, A number one, uh, another one I'd mention would be that Fortify Rights Group, which is a human rights group from a Christian perspective, which is trying to get the facts down and write these reports that then can be used to help um, place pressure on the government of Myanmar or, or other places in Southeast Asia to change these policies. Yeah. Um, so that they want to find out more up to date, obviously they could Google and find all kinds of histories like yeah. that, but these are a couple organizations that's, that are doing something right now yeah. and they can, they can find out from uh, eyewitnesses uh, and, and, and find direct help that yeah. the kind of things that those people need. Um, I, I want to close with a theological question because <laughs> I'm a theologian, you know, and so this is something that, um, that, that's just on my mind, and that is um, do the Rohingyas and Christians worship the same God? I think that's a, another good question there, <laughs> <laughs> and I think uh, I am not called to make a, a, a <laughs> distinction on that. I am called to show love to them. Oh. And I know my God calls me to show love to them as um, image bearers of our God. Well, that's a that's a very good good answer. I've been thinking about that a lot. Uh, Nicholas Walterstorff, a philosopher that I respect very much, he states uh, in his books um, that he feels that any religion that holds uh, the old the Hebrew Old Testament as part of their sacred books. We should see them as worshiping the same God, mm-hmm. even though they may misconstrue the nature of that God and his relationship to Jesus. But yet, anybody who is worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we should see them as worshiping the same God. And he says, otherwise, there's, there's just a no starter in the conversation. Does that, does that resonate at all, or is that, is that just that's hit you as like a terrible no, that, heresy? That, that does resonate with me. I think uh, that resonates very well with me. Yeah, so they might know half of the story, but they don't know the story of Jesus Christ and his love for them. And that is what we can continue to share with them. When you talk about misconstruing the nature of God in relation to Jesus, um, I, I think there are a lot of Christians who probably couldn't define the Trinity correctly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we would still yeah. consider them our brothers. It just seems like we, we, we have even a, a, maybe we even a closer connection to them than we think, you know? that uh, in some sense, those are our brothers and sisters. I hope you're right. Yes. Uh, Sid, this has been a delight. Thank you so much, and um, I hope you'll keep us posted. On well, thank your, you for having me. Your journeys, yeah. yes. And uh, it must have been a tremendous thing for Jonathan to be able to see this, and um, you know, to see his father uh, so concerned about people in need. What a wonderful testament and what a wonderful legacy you leave for your family. So thank you, and thank you for being with us. We hope that you'll be right here again next week. 